Hello, biohacking bestie. How are you doing? We have another great episode today with Dr. Dorenda Van Deken. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her a little later, but I just want to give you some updates on what's been happening in June and July, because I just got back from the Health Optimization Summit and it was amazing. And I will definitely go to the next one. This was held in London and it's just a chance for a lot of biohacking people to get together, health optimization people, uh, a lot of products out there too. I got the best part of this was the community, just being with my people. It was so amazing to spend time with Natalie Nidham. You guys know her podcast. It's now change to instead of biohacking superhuman performance, which nobody could remember, it's now just called longevity. So go and follow her. Definitely you'll like her. I got to see my my friend Sarah Trefford, then Leslie Kenny from Primadine, Nikki Burns from Nebu Naturals. These are people who are sponsoring the podcast, but they're also very good friends. And I absolutely adore them. Dr. Nicola Conlin from Nuchito, Tony Wrighton, he's got another great podcast called Zestology. He was there. Edward from Science Beat. You're going to be hearing more and more about that. It's basically a new ring rival to the aura, but it's actually does something different, measures inflammation. I'll, I'll talk about that later. I also got to meet for the first time in person, some of my guests, Dr. Amy Horneman, Dr. Mindy Peltz, JJ Virgin, Dr. Stephanie Estima. These were all doctors who were presenting and it was so great to connect with them too. There were some amazing presentations. Natalie Nidham also did, just smashed it with the, the peptides. And Mindy Peltz, my gosh, her energy was friggin' amazing, wonderful speaker. We also got to see Dr. Stephen Gundry and Ben Greenfield and Nasha Winters, I think that's her name, Nasha. I'm going to have her on the podcast. She's pretty amazing. She talks a lot about hormones and cancer. She's coming up. And it was also fun to meet people like you who follow the podcast. And it was so great to meet up. So Absolutely love you and adore you for finding me. And we took some photos together. It was wonderful. In terms of products at the Health Optimization Summit, fabulous. You know, I'm always looking out for products for us and uh, what can we what can we use for our menopause symptoms or what can help us sleep better or look better or feel better. Of course, Primadine by Oxford Health Spend was there. Nebu Naturals, isn't that the, you know, makeupless makeup that I absolutely love having as well. I'm wearing it right now. I got a chance to meet Patrick McEwen of Oxygen Advantage. This is the instructor I had for my breathing, my breathing coaching training certification. It's so amazing to actually meet him in person finally. And, and of course, Nuchito was there. And then there were some new products that I'm exploring, Be Minerals. And there's another one called, what was it called? Repower, I think. These are minerals, electrolytes that I think are quite essential. I found, I discovered a new product called London Nootropics, and it's actually coffee with adaptogens and mushrooms, and it was absolutely gorgeous. So I'm going to explore that a little bit more. And seriously, the best collagen I've ever had in my life called Health Nag. I wish all these people were sponsors. They hopefully will be one day, but these are the ones I'm going to be exploring. This collagen is not a powder. It's a gel. It's like jello. And I ate almost the whole thing when it was like 30 servings. I tried to get it in into a whole weekend, <laughs> sharing it with everybody too, because I couldn't take it on the plane, but absolutely going to explore that a little bit more. And there was another great um, protein powder was actually called willpower. And I think this influencer Davina, Davinia Taylor, she's quite big in the UK is making this powder. I was going to look into that. And then there's an interesting product called leapfrog that was helps with sleep and immunity. It's got uh, lactobacillus and it's a type of, or actually, I think it's a different type of bacteria, but I got a pretty strong testimonial from Natalie Nidham who tried to sleep and had an amazing sleep. So anyways, also met with Gary Rhodes, who I'll be connecting more with. He's got a REMS machine, R-E-M-S. If you don't know what this is, go back to the episode that we did uh, with Dr. Doug Lucas. We did one just before this one, but we talked about the REMS more in the first episode that we did. And I'll put those in the show notes. And he, there was a power plate there, the REMS machine. And he's got this new technique called Bone Strong. And this is all for testing your bone density and strength. 
Okay. REMS is, is kind of the, I don't want to say the rival to the DEXA, but DEXA measures bone density, REMS measures bone strength, and are both quite important. So stay tuned for that. All weekend long, I had probably three full on days and then another day, full days of travel. My hips held up. You guys know that I'm trying to reverse this osteoarthritis, the hips, and I've been getting PRP injections. I had my third one just on Monday. And those things like bounce me back to life. I know platelet rich plasma injections doesn't always work for everybody, but for me, it's like gold and I could get through the whole thing. Went quite a lot of walking around, which I wasn't able to do in January, probably couldn't walk more than five minutes. And now I was here all day. Of course, you know, my hips were throbbing at the end of the day. So I'm still working on that. I'm making an episode. I will promise you to get this solo episode on osteoarthritis and soul journey. I had what I've tried, what works, what doesn't. And then for the future now where I'm traveling, I'm, this is summer and uh, well, summer, I'm a nomad. So I always travel, but summer in Europe is where I'm going to be. I'm going to London today. And Warsaw, oh, actually, by the time this podcast comes out, I'll be finished with London. Um, having time heading to Warsaw, I'll be in Poland, bouncing around, then Mejev and places in France, definitely Marbella in Spain. I'll be making more reels for women around the world, asking them about their menopause experience. So stay tuned for that. Now, let's get to the episode. We covered a lot. And with this guest of mine, Dr. Van Deken, and she's quite a, quite the experienced woman here in Europe. And we talked about menopause treatments in Europe, particularly in Holland, because that's where she's from. We talked about which countries in Europe are more progressive when it comes to menopause treatment. We talked about the menopause guidelines and doctor training in Europe. So this, this episode was really focused on the differences between, say, North America and Europe. And, and a lot of women are curious to see, what, yeah, what are those differences? We talked about the attitudes that women and practitioners have towards hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy, HRT, what do you want to call it in Europe? She uses the word GP very often. That means general practitioner. It's just your, your doctor. And then she, we talked about what, what she's actually doing. I think she said 7 million euro grant that she got for menopause research. And she's going to explain what that is and how she got it. She talked about hot flashes and what it actually puts us more risk at risk for mental health. She's really into the mental health part of piece of menopause. She talked about tips on how to ease your way through menopause and lower these symptoms, how women differ from men in medicine and what needs to change in, in the curriculum and in the workplace in, in Europe. And she, we talked about best ways to get your information on menopause and she busted some myths, menopause myths that we have in Europe. And then at the very end, we talked a little bit about testosterone. She, she mentioned it. She said she prescribes it and explained a bit how that works in Europe. And then I mentioned, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'd love to know your thoughts more on testosterone because I know it's so much more than just libido, right? It has effects on your motivation, on your muscle, on the way you feel, uh, your bones, and that kind of, you know, just went off at this list. And she said, no, there is no effect of testosterone on the bone and the other things that you mentioned. And then she quotes some research done by Susan Davis, who I'd love to get on the on the podcast. So then uh, this kind of threw me back. I was like, wait, what? And, you know, scratch record sound. <laughs> and I, because literally the episode just before this one was with Dr. Doug Lucas, who's all about osteoporosis. That's his jam. He's the bone guy. He's so I, I reached out to him and I was like, what's the deal with this? Because she mentioned the global consensus consensus position statement on the use of testosterone therapy for women. Okay. This is a global, pos global positioning. Like this is what all the doctors kind of look at kind of like in the menopause society, you know, what are the menopause society guidelines? And there are certain guidelines and a position statement that, that she, she looks at or at that this thing, it looks at all the research that's out there. And this positioning statement is endorsed by the International Menopause Society, the Endocrine Society, the European Menopause and Anthropause Society, International Society for Sexual Medicine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's so many of these societies that endorse this. And, you know, so I threw this out at Dr. Doug Lucas. I was like, I looked, I started looking at this paper 
And I was like, okay, what am I going to make of this? In the end, you know, of course, during the, the episode, I, I, I wasn't prepared. I just said, you know what, I'm going to go look through this and, and, and see what I find. And basically when you look at the research on testosterone and women, it's just, there's, there's not a whole lot of information in general. It's just, and it's not discussed so much. This is why testosterone is kind of like the last piece of HRT. It's really misunderstood. And, you know, so, so research really looks at men and testosterone, not so much at women. It's quite controversial in this space as well, unless you follow people like me who are all about like promoting testosterone with our guests. So yeah, you're going to find not, you know, pretty sparse information on this. And, but, you know, testosterone is just, you know, one of the sex hormones that women produce. It's totally overlooked. We actually produce three times as much testosterone as estrogen before we reach the menopause phase, right? So it's like, we have, we have it, right? We just don't have as much as men. It's, 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 it's not like the primary one, but compared to estrogen, because we always say estrogen is, is the primary uh, sex hormone for women. It's quite, quite relatively speaking, it's quite a lot. So I went and dug into some of the research and I am finding research about testosterone and its importance for women in, in bone density and muscle mass and cognitive function and mood and sexual function and energy. I've got links in the show notes to some of this research that I, I pulled out. And of course, you know, this, this is just a few pieces, but just over and over again, you know, I find uh, another, you know, these are all PubMed studies, quote, a quote, in postmenopausal women, testosterone supplementation improved several domains of sexual response, including sexual desire, pleasure and arousal, orgasm, and self-image. Now, across the board, everybody agrees with this. This is why she says this is, you know, we prescribe testosterone only for low libido or hyposexual desire syndrome. Okay. But I find research that says, quote, it has also been shown to have additional benefits, including the improvement of neurogen neurogenital, psychological, and somatic symptoms, an increase in bone density, and enhancement of cognitive performance when combined with estrogen as part of an HRT. Now, of course, this is, is it the testosterone? Is it the estrogen? But a lot of men, it says here, many women notice that taking as testosterone improves their mood, concentration, motivation, and energy. And just, you know, study after study, you know, association, between testosterone levels and bone mineral density in females age 40 to 60. Really, I'm finding plenty of research. Now, perhaps for these international menopause societies, it's not good enough, or there's errors, or they're just, they just don't seem to be convinced. But I always say, you're the biohacker. You figure this out. You talk to your doctor. You, if you decide, well, you want to see if testosterone is one of the pieces of the puzzle of all the things that you are doing for your bone density or for your mood or your motivation or muscle mass, whatever it is, like you, you can test this out yourself with, of course, with the guidance of your do of the doctor. So anyways, the problem that a lot of doctors have in prescribing testosterone, is just that there's, there's, they don't feel maybe there's enough research or they just not up to date with it. And also one big problem is that there's no available license preparations for women. I think actually in Australia, they they came up with one. I think in the UK, they're coming up with one. But as far as I understand in the US and North America and Canada, it's not quite there. But so that's why we get compounded testosterone, right? You can't just go to the pharmacy and say, okay, let's just take the men's portion, but it, which is absurd, absurdly high for us. In Europe, I know doctors are, are, are prescribing the, the, you, the male versions, the dosages of, of, or not the dosages, the male hormones, like you pick up at the pharmacy, the pharmaceutical testosterone, but they would tell the patient to cut the dosage in a fraction of what it is for the men. Again, um, I, I per personally prefer compounded testosterone rather than trying to have to you know, squeeze out some minimal amount of a, a male version, but I don't know. That's just me. Um, there are doctors that instead of testosterone, they can use DHEA and pregnenolone because these are precursors for testosterone. And that's what Dr. Doug Lucas is doing. He's writing a whole chapter in his book. He's got a new book coming out. He's took a deep dive into testosterone, which we talked about it, but we didn't talk about his book that's coming out. And he sent me a chapter of this to 
take a look at it. And and so he's prescribing testosterone, but he's leaning a little bit more towards doing the precursors, but to be continued. We'll see what he does in the end. So who's our guest? Let's meet Dr. Dorinda Van Daken. I'll give you a little intro about her because I found her through the European Menopause and Andropause Society, which I'm a member of. And I reached out to them and I said, I really want to know some of the, you know, I want to interview an expert that you have here on the European side of things. Now, Dr. Van Deken is born and raised in Amsterdam. That's in, and she's in Holland. She completed her medical education at the University of Amsterdam. And since 1994, she's been a gynecologist at the OLVG. Now that's ready for this. Onse Lieve Vrue Gastuis is <laughs> this is the in Dutch I know I probably butchered that but it's a major clinical hospital um, in Ooster Park in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and she's been working on on the problems and treatments of menopause for over 25 years so this has become a really big part of or you know subs of our subspecialization with gynecology she's been the chairman of the DMS which is the Dutch Menopause Society since 2015. She's an associated and a member of, of, she's associated with, and she's a member of the NVOG, which is the Dutch Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And she's really active on the subject of menopause and training, training other doctors and nurses and medical practitioners. And she also co-authors a variety of national and international guidelines, and she's involved in the scientific research. And she gives a lot of this advanced training and education about menopause and, and she organizes conferences and she gives the training to the nurses and GPs. And she really believes that menopause complaints must be truly recognized among healthcare professionals and that women really should be taken seriously and not unnecessarily medicalized. But she also wants women to get the correct hormone therapy. So in her own practice, she, she collaborates with a lot of other professionals like psychiatrists, cardiologists, neurologists, sexologists, or internists. So it's because she, she really sees that menopause needs a multidisciplinary approach. And so you'll find these other practitioners in her, in her own practice. And cause she's not a neurologist, but she understands the connection of the brain and menopause. So she may want to get dive in a little deeper with, with, with a neurologist, for example. So she, because of this and her belief in this multidisciplinary approach, she founded the first multidisciplinary menopausal problems clinic, MOPP, at the OLVG, which is that clinical hospital in Amsterdam. And she doesn't practice obstetrics anymore, but she focuses entirely on gynecology. And she has a lot of international contacts with gynecologists who are also involved in her approach to menopause. And she's just someone who loves to keep learning and evolving. So here she goes. She's the chairman of the Dutch Menopause Society. She's on the board of the IMS, the International Menopause Society. She's a member of the editorial board of the website, Vruweine de Vorgenon. <laughs> if you're Dutch, you know what that is. She's the contact point social card VGV of Amsterdam. She's a member of the NVOG, which is the Dutch Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She's a member of the board of VPG, Reproductive Medicine Department. She's got there's teacher training and menopause nurses at Erasmus MC Rotterdam at the Erasmus University Medical Center, which is the largest and one of the most authoritative scientific university medical centers in Europe. So I believe we have somebody who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> so I think that's it. I think you've had enough of the introduction and just let's just dive into the interview. So enjoy the show. All right. So it's a great pleasure and, and really true honor to have Dr. Van Deken, welcome. I'm, I'm super excited to have this chat with you because we haven't really yet interviewed someone from Europe on and their perspective on menopause because we have such a North American centric audience, but we have about 30, 35% of our audiences in Europe and, and elsewhere. So they count. And I'm really, really excited to have you share some of your perspective because you're in Holland right now and that's that's your base, but you do you are very active in this in this menopause community in Europe. And and you yourself, you've been treating women in menopause as well as helping just generally women's health for over overall maybe 
three decades in Holland? <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel real old, but that's the truth. Yes. I'm a but gynecologist you... for 30 years already. Yeah. Wow. And before that in training, of course, and studying. Well, in the bio, yeah, you have quite, quite the biography here and quite the experience. And so I'm really interested to hear your opinion and you're, you're super active. Yeah. Just in general with women's health issues in Europe in general, but what are some of the differences that you're seeing among different countries and cultures around the world, or perhaps just mostly in Europe in terms of treating a woman through menopause? Yeah, what I see, well, uh, the Netherlands is a little bit different. It has a different healthcare system compared to the other European countries, because in our country, we have the system that uh, a woman can't uh, go directly to a specialist. She needs to be referred by a GP. So her first stop is the GP. And uh, nowadays, we're making a big improvement with that. But we had a lack in knowledge about uh, medicine menopausal care, hormonal care, so uh, specifically women's health care in the Netherlands with the GPs for a couple of years, especially after the WHI study, uh, there was a knowledge gap for about 10 or till 15 years. So that makes the Netherlands a little bit different. And besides that, we're a sort of, I always call it a Calvinistic, Calvinistic uh, people. Uh, we're not, we're very reluctant to take any hormones, but we, for the past couple of years, there's been a big change to that. So in my opinion, the UK is far ahead in uh, treating women with, for instance, HRT, but uh, we're, we're keeping up. When you say that you're reluctant to, 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 rec to recommend hormones or to prescribe hormones, is that the same also for like thyroid hormone or women who have um, early menopause in their 20s and 30s who are hormone deficient? Is it similar? No, no, that's a good question. No, it's not similar because women who have early menopause, like the premature ovarian insufficiency, see the POIs, it's considered as an abnormal uh, uh, stage. And so that's been referred to gynecologists uh, uh, quickly. Uh, thyroid hormones is not a problem either. But for instance, if you look to the uh, dermatologic uh, treatments like eczema or other, for instance, fulvers, diseases uh, women are reluctant to apply corticosteroids and uh, for HRT it's been uh, after the WHI it was said that there was a bigger risk a 26 fold bigger risk for uh, breast cancer and of course the whole world uh, uh, knew after a while that these figures were not correct, so it was not the case. But in the Netherlands, we were uh, lacking behind in that. There was still thought for many years that it would increase your risk of breast cancer. But that's, I think this book is closed for the past five years or so, and especially since for two years, we have a new guideline for GPs, which is a big improvement. And that makes a big difference. And you're actually part of the team writing, writing, rewriting these guidelines, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious to you know, just to clarify from my understanding. So the past 10, 20 years, let's say the WHI, in case anybody doesn't know what that is, it's the Women's Health Initiative study that came out in 2002 and, and yeah. scared everybody off the hormones. And now it's been debunked. So now when you say that um, the you said one time the women's women were reluctant to take hormones, w was it both the doctors reluctant to prescribe and the women reluctant to take or is it one or the other? No, it was both because uh, especially GPs, they didn't have any experience anymore in age prescribing HRT. And uh, the problem with the WHI was that it was a study group of older women and they used different types of HRT than we use, used to use in Europe now Worldwide, we use more bioidentical hormones. We use also lower uh, dosages. And the thing was in the media, it was said that the risk of breast cancer was 
26 times bigger uh, of getting breast, developing breast cancer due to HRT, but that was not correct. So the, there was a misinterpretation of the figures of the study. And that was um, uh, thought to be correct in the Netherlands for quite a while, because I don't know why, but in other countries, it was gynecologists knew that these figures were not correct, that you couldn't compare the figures of the WHI study to the present type of HRT and to the also to the present population were prescribing it. So we were lacking behind in the Netherlands for quite a while. But now that, like I said, the book is almost closed, not really, but almost closed. And wow. we see that there are more and more GPs who are prescribing HRT and also due to the new guideline. So you said Holland was lacking behind behind Europe or behind yeah. globally or what? what? Both, both. Oh, wow. <laughs> also in Europe. So see, for instance, our, one of our neighbor countries or two actually are the UK and Belgium. And HRT is prescribed there far more than in the Netherlands. Uh, we see that uh, almost to give you some figures, we have in the Netherlands, we see it's uh, similar to worldwide that one out of five women doesn't experience any complaints whatsoever, but about 28% has severe uh, disturbing complaints. And in the Netherlands, uh, they are prescribed nowadays. It was as for three years, uh, less than 5% of these women were prescribed HRT, which is still the most helpful treatment. And now for the past year, it turned out it was six and a half percent. So we're improving, but you see, that the other countries in Europe, it differs between 10, 15 percent, some of them even 30 percent. So we're still uh, 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 trying hard. We're, we're filling the gap. <laughs> mm. where, where where do you in Europe is the highest um the best or I guess the 30 percent yeah I I I, I think uh, I'm not really sure but I think uh, because it's not always measurable but like you see the uh, Mediterranean countries like Greece like Spain uh, like Italy uh, HRT is even available at a pharmacy you can just go there and buy it so it's not always on prescription and in the Netherlands it's only available on prescription so uh it's not always measurable, but uh, we see uh, that these countries, it's more uh, used in these countries than in our country, at least. That's very interesting. So I'm in Spain and I spent a lot of time in Spain and I started my personal menopause journey with it uh, <laughs> three years ago. You were right. I was surprised. I, I was only on progesterone and estriol, which those yeah. were over the counter. I wasn't yet taking estradiol. And then I noticed over the last three years that I'm asked for a prescription, like they want me to show the prescription and yeah. the actual piece of paper. And, yeah. and so now they're actually saying, no, we also want the QR code and they really want, they'll only give you one month at a time. So I feel like in Spain, they're getting stricter and stricter and tighter and tighter in this area. So I'm wondering what, what are your thoughts? Why you think that's moving in that direction? Yeah, I think that's good because the thing is, if you just can buy it, you don't know if the amount is the right amount for you and uh, nobody's checking how long a user you are. So I think it's good to do some checkup on that. That's. Uh, but I noticed that Dutch women who are on holidays in one of these three countries, if they forgot to take their HRT, they always, they can just buy it and uh, there's not a limit. Well, there is a small limit to the amount, but they can, they if they buy it at one pharmacy, they can go to another and buy some more there as well. So <laughs> I think it's good. There is, there are making, the these countries are making limits to this. Yeah, yeah, it is true. When I, when the, the first time that happened to me, I just went to the next pharmacy and they gave it to me. But, yeah, but exactly. now I have to go through two or three pharmacies before I find, yeah. you know, every, yeah. every time it's a little bit harder. And as a nomad, I, I travel a lot. Sometimes I need yeah. to take a three month supply with me. So, but yeah. yeah, this is, you can ask the GP here or the doctors in general uh, there. Yeah. I would at least the, I'm in Andalusia in the very South and perhaps it's different in the parts of Spain, but it is 
quite accessible. Uh, doctors are not as trained or up to speed as is in terms of the, what I understand in terms of the method of delivery or the variety of options. Like here, we don't have the patch. We don't mm. have compounding pharmacies that can make organic oils. They'll just make, you know, the regular stuff. So I find that at least in Spain, it's like that, but it's, it's good that it's progressing. And, and I'm glad to, to hear in, in Holland, at least it's, it's changing. And you said, you said a couple of times, you know, the book is nearly closed on this does this mean that most doctors in holland are up to speed and trained on how to treat a woman through menopause and they're confident with that well not not as much as we would like to because uh most of them and most women uh especially they realize that the risks are not as uh, big or bad as has been thought before and uh what we see and i understood i was as an uh, in Firenze at an endocrinological congress about two weeks ago, that I hear the same from um, other countries, from my colleagues from the UK, from Germany, from Italy as well, that we see there has been a change. Uh, uh, while women were very reluctant to use HRT, we now see that they are really uh, asking for HRT a lot, and they uh, do. They want to have uh, better health, and there are even some women who are stating that when you turn into menopause, you are lacking your hormones, so it needs to be uh, given back to you with HRT. Uh, so. So we see a big change in that, and um, uh, well, well, we also see that that there it, it differs where from where you live. Like with the bigger cities, like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, you see that most uh, GPs and gynecologists are up to date. But if you go further into the smaller in the county, into the smaller villages, uh, there. Can be uh, some progression can be made there, um, but it's it it takes time. But it's going it's improving a lot. But it it takes time. You can't make the change in one or two years. It takes more time. And we see that the new generation of GPs are really taking over. Uh, it's this topic is in the training for gynecologist, but it's not a topic in the training for GP yet. So. We it it well. So 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 how long has it been since gynecologists had training with menopause? <laughs> Only two years. That's oh. uh, it took me over ten years to get it into the training, but oh. it's been in the part of the training for two years now. Yeah. Oh, and I know I, I just I gave a, a lecture, a training for GPs on Saturday, a very good and enthusiastic group. And I noticed they were very good up to date with HRT and they had some questions for me because they sometimes uh, when they had a question, they were referring to the gynecologist in their uh, neighborhood. And uh, I, I realized they, the GP, even knew it better than the gynecologist did so in Amsterdam I think I know more GPs who have better knowledge of HRT than a colleague uh, gynecologists that's uh, oh. yeah it's it's not considered to be we we need to make a new mindset I think because women's health is her uh, hormones are part of women's health but other diseases as well uh, like what we call benign gynecology and we see for instance that about one percent of all the uh, research grants uh, is going to this topic to women's health all the 99% of the money goes to oncology and goes to uh, surgery uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. And we need to make a different mindset, but we're on our way. Well done. I'm really, uh, uh, that's why I'm so honored to have you here. And you, I'm yeah. so proud of you for the work that you're doing. And it's mm -hmm. finally coming to fruition and you're seeing it not only in the doctors, but as well as, as patients. And so wonderful yeah. to women 
to be starting to get up to speed too and understanding. And, yeah. and I always like them to ask the right questions too, because mm -hmm. I would like to know your thoughts. It seems as like the pendulum is swinging, you know, the other <laughs> way, right? Yeah. Before it was, you know, we were in this middle and then, it, you know, hormones are bad and really horrible yeah. and the pendulum swung one way. And yeah. now people yeah. are like, it's anti-aging. It's a miracle. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and I'm wondering... it's not a silver bullet unfortunately but we see what we see at least in the Netherlands that groups of women are standing up and asking to be taken seriously and well everybody knows that women are not similar to men but all medications are uh, tested for men everything uh, we prescribe uh, like dosages and everything is is uh, measured with men and not with women and we i don't know how it's in the rest of the world i think that it's the same everywhere but women are standing up and that's well that's so good to see yeah i'm so i'm so happy finally it's starting to take take fruition and and i think a yeah. lot of people it, the the whole pendulum swinging the other way I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are because the way I, I see it myself is I've done some menopause training that uh, through through for doctors, actually, though I'm not a doctor, but they allowed me to take the program. It, this is in the U.S. So I was wondering if uh, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to see how they're training doctors. But I'm I, I still feel that there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. I, I think mm -hmm. it's you know great what we're doing already. A lot, lot to grow, and I explain to women because there are so they are so confused because it seems as though prescribing hormones to women is an art. Okay, it's not just the hormones. There's a lot of other factors in the body that have to take into consideration, other blood markers, and how their symptoms and their health and all these things. And so I call it like the wild, wild west. Here we're still. <laughs> kind of figuring this out. So, you know, I think there's risks if you do things and risks if you don't do things. It's just the way life is. So, um, but when I see the pendulum swinging completely the other way, and sometimes women are disappointed when they go into the GP and they get their mm -hmm. prescription, they're like, either I feel nothing or it's not working or I feel worse or, you know, mm -hmm. it, it takes time. I think to help us figure this out is no one size fits all. So I'm no. wondering, yeah, what your thoughts are on this sort of pendulum swinging and then where are we today and how a woman can navigate this space? Well, I, I totally agree with you. There isn't, unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all. And I don't think it's an art. I think it's a profession uh, to prescribe HRT. I think it's, uh, you need some uh, medical knowledge, some basic knowledge. And the thing is, since it's not a one size fits all, every woman is different. And we know that even uh, between women, they can respond differently to different types of HRT. For instance, the transdermal type of HRT, like the patch, the spray, the gel we have in the Netherlands, you apply on the skin, it's not uh, uh, absorbed or I don't know the right word for that uh, by the uh, uh, by every woman in the same way. So there is a difference, and you need to have some knowledge about that. That's for one. I think what we see is that uh, uh, that's difficult for women themselves. So you have to rely on your doctor, your specialist, or your GP. And we are improving the knowledge. And what doesn't help so much is that uh, in Netherlands, but like I said, in other countries as well, there are a lot of... Uh, well, like influencers, uh, journalists, uh, hormone specialist, which is not a, uh, um, uh, everybody can call uh, him or herself a hormone specialist. It's not a, a something which is protected or, uh, and uh, there there is a lot of information on the internet for women, which makes it even more confusing for them. And uh, that's why in the Netherlands, I wrote together with a, a colleague of mine, I wrote a practical guideline for HRT uh, in with schedules and everything and all the information information in a small document so but it's meant uh, for professionals but women can use it as well to get a little bit more understanding of what HRT is all about and what the different types are so 
that might be a bit help, but uh, internationally, like with the IMS, the International Menopause Society, and also the British Menopause Society, they are uh, working on new global guidelines uh, for HRT, since we noticed that uh, not only care professionals, but also women want to have this knowledge, but still it's a profession. <laughs> Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, it's it's more what I meant to say is like a personal. It's a personalization of yeah. It's the personalized actual... medicine. Yeah, and yeah. you always has to have to start. The basics is diet and lifestyle. It's like what sometimes is thought that if I just take HRT, I will be uh, it will improve my health in the long run. But the basics is diet and lifestyle. HRT is like I said, not a silver bullet. You have have to have a healthier lifestyle and not and don't start at 50 start earlier that's uh yeah i completely agree i always say you can't out hormone a bad diet and lifestyle so no. we need to take everything in consideration and and i'm in this biohacking world and i have this pyramid and i like to say the foundation is there and the, and the hormones yeah. are are up there in the middle and the top tiers because yeah. it's it, but i how i do see plenty of women too who really are doing all the right things and they're mm -hmm. still having hot flashes or night sweats or yeah. anxiety well, depression yeah. things that they would never even relate to menopause some a lot of women don't even realize joint pain can be related so they'll go see you know the mm -hmm. trauma traumatologist so it's it's one of those things i i think um it's it can be very, very useful too, even when you got all the things right. And and that can be really life-changing as well. Yeah, and but it's important as well. I think if, you, if you're suffering from complaints and specifically the uh, vasomotor complaints like the hot flashes and the night sweats, we know that uh, these complaints can give you a bigger risk for cardiovascular accidents. Recently, uh, uh, Pauline Maki and Rebecca Thur and did a research that hot flushes and night sweats might even give you a bigger risk for Alzheimer diseases. They don't, they're still examining uh, what the connection, exact connection is, but we know that suffering from these complaints is not healthy. So all these women need uh, to prescribe, they, they need to have proper care at first and if necessary, prescribed HRT. And I think also, that in the long run, uh, like uh, Pauline Maki already does that, for instance, if you have suffered from a depression uh, before, we see that um, it re usually the, there is a five about a fivefold risk that you will get it back uh, during a perimenopausal transition. And I think for that, but also maybe other uh, complaints or symptoms uh, we in the in in the future in the near future i hope we will start prescribing hrt as well uh, just for prevention but only with the women who are at risk at least to start with now have you had any patients like that who who went through depression in their 20s or yeah. 30s mm -hmm. they get through menopause then it comes back again and have you been able to prescribe them hormone therapy and yeah. they are able to get better again yeah yeah for sure well uh, the thing is we don't have that much knowledge about it most research is has been done so far like to, for the uh, vasomotor symptoms so the hot flushes and night sweats and what we see in the netherlands that the guideline for gps is only about that topic but there is uh, uh not so much knowledge and also not not recognition for women with uh, psychiatric problems or mental problems. And in the hospital where I work, uh, we uh, organized a specific out clinic specifically for these women. Because for instance, we also see that ADHD is being, uh, there has an, an uh, 
has been a study in the United States which showed that about 60% of all women with ADHD has been diagnosed during perimenopause. And we see that, for instance, ADHD, but also women who are bipolar or with autistic syndromes, uh, it's all connected with the hormone estrogen. So if your estrogen lowers, your estrogen level lowers, like, for instance, is also in during your menstrual cycle or after birth, but specifically during after menopause, uh, then you see that these women, they experience severe uh symptoms of their underlying um well syndrome or disease and we are doing research right now to see if there what is the uh, uh impact of uh, for instance the birth control pill they use it before because we know that synthetic progestogens can have uh or worse influence on mental on your mental health uh but also what is the role of hrt uh or do we need to prescribe more uh, antidepressants or other forms of therapy so we're doing that research right now but we see that doing we we're doing an out i do an out clinic together with a psychiatrist where we're the two of us and that's very helpful for women so they have two specialists at once where they can ask all their questions and together we have a little bit of knowledge of the other specialism but that they, they, we're not the expert in that field and but together we're stronger and we can give better help and better advice I love that the mind body a connection. Yeah, yeah. And well, the both. mind and the, the, that's you're totally right. The mind body is not two different things. It's intertwined. It's connected. That's uh, but you. I'm I'm not trained in the mind, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's why this. I I believe in in multidisciplinary uh, in the multidisciplinary field. We, yeah. But also right. the sleep. Sleep is almost a profession in its own nowadays. So we also have a neurologist who, who is specialized in sleep. Sleep is very important. That's, uh, and we still don't know the role of hormones in the lack of sleep. So we're studying that as well. Yes. Tell us a little bit more, because when we had our chat uh, previously, you mentioned a grant that you were able yeah. to get a hold yeah. of. Can you yeah. share a little bit about yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, well, it's it's not only due to me. I was, uh, the thing is, if asking for such a big grant, because we wanted to have the highest amount possible, the limit was 10 million euros, and we opted for nine and a half million but a grant, you can only apply for a grant if you work in an academic hospital, uh, which I don't. But there was a professor of internal medicine. He specialized in endocrinology. Uh, is Peter Bischop is his name. And he applied for the grant uh, together with the help of another uh, doctor of internal medicine and also the doctor she is specialized in cell biology and me were with the four of us and we uh, formed a real big group it's called a consortium we need to have a lot of co-financing as well before if you up the, the amount you apply for you have to take care that you have financed at least 10 percent of this amount yourself in written uh, agreements before the application and we applied for it and well, we got it. That's uh, mm -hmm. and we hope uh, we're uh, we don't only hope, but we're convinced that we're going to make a big difference in the Netherlands. And we have there are about 12 uh, PhDs uh, who can uh, uh, work all this uh, out. And we have uh, four work packages. The first one is about uh, mental health and sleep. So we're going to do more research about that. The the second one is about the physical aspect like cardiovascular diseases, but also thyroid diseases, migraine uh, and menopause, for instance. And number three is about uh, menopause and the workplace, which is still a big problem. 
that uh, and it costs uh, the community a lot of money but also for the women it's very frustrating especially if you're the one who brings home the money uh, mm -hmm. and you can't work due to menopause and number four is uh, we want to get rid of the taboo and we want to have the menopause as seen as something which is normal and which every doctor has some cognition and recognition about uh, because we know a lot of obstetrics women differ from men in my opinion in three things uh, we have menstrual cycles which is a little there can be more knowledge about that it's mm -hmm. but it's already a bit more than menopause we can deliver we can get pregnant and deliver and obstetrics is still very included in everything but uh, number three is menopause and it's always it's lacking behind the knowledge it's not it should be in the books biological books in high schools and basic schools that uh, there is something about menstrual cycles something about anti-conception anti contraception but then it stops that's uh mm. so and we get older so we need to know what's uh for the new generation we want to take away the walls the, the current generation now experiences well done i'm so excited for this research and you focus on such important topics and yeah we just need more menopause research too. So yeah, yeah. the workplace is very interesting. I just heard a statistic, I think it was $1.8 billion is lost in women not being able to work in the workplace. I don't know if that's, uh, I can't remember if that was US or global, but um, I think that's global. If you see, the thing is, I I, I still think it's very much underestimated because <laughs> women feel ashamed about menopause in the workplace. They don't dare to mention it, not even to their colleagues. We did some research in the Netherlands and we see that only one out of 10 women dares to mention it in the workplace, but they're not, they're reluctant to visit a doctor for that it's still a big taboo and in the Netherlands only it's about seven milliard uh, euros it costs and we're we're convinced that it's far bigger than that yeah seven million meaning billion right billion yeah sorry seven yeah. billion only wow. in the no uh, yeah uh, uh, um, not million but one B uh, billion yeah the B, yeah yeah, yeah milliards yeah, is, yeah, yeah some yeah, people still say yeah, milliard yeah. but it's billion yeah. that's in billion seven million only in the Netherlands so yeah wow that's insane that, yeah. so we definitely it'll be when does this research when do you think you'll start having some data to release <laughs> on this research well we just started last February so it will take at least two years that's uh, maybe a little bit sooner and so for the impact what we want to make in the Netherlands uh, we have to wait for another two years or so and then we're going to start probably big campaigns or anything or more we need more awareness but but well, 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 we're very happy we got this grant. That's, uh, yeah. That's exciting. And we'll have to have you two years from now to see the results. And yeah. I'm wondering how you think is, you know, you're doing a lot of training yourself, you know, yeah. person by person or group by group. And yeah. how how is, how do women, how do you think women in Holland or in Europe or in general are getting is the best way to get the information to them like do you, do you have a plan on how to get the, the general population up to speed uh, not really. That's part of the campaign of our grant, actually, because what we noticed, like you mentioned before yourself, that there are still women who have complaints and they don't realize it might be due to menopause or menopausal transition. They don't have the recognition about that. Sometimes their husbands <laughs> say, uh, are you not? I hear that a lot mm -hmm. in our out clinic that my husband said, are you not into menopause? And I always say, your husband is my hero because he he at least thinks about it 
and uh, uh, but so we and we there is a lot of information like I said on on the internet we have websites we have books we have podcasts for instance and still there are some women who don't get the right information or don't realize that their complaints might be uh, the men or due to the menopause uh, and that's something you have to research as well. So we're doing that, but you have to train all the GPs. Like in Amsterdam, I was invited to most of the GPs out clinics to be after working time to give a small lecture about menopause. And, uh, uh, but I also give trainings to bigger groups. But the thing is with every training, whether they are GPs or other specialists, you only, uh, the ones who are interested in the topic, they mm. are visiting the training. So you can't reach them all. That's, uh, so it needs to be part of the uh, educational training for the specialists and GPs, I think. But also other, like for instance, we, we are trying to achieve that right now. If a woman has severe palpitations or uh, breast uh, pressure complaints, also cardiologists need to think about menopause. And like you said before, muscle and joint pains or aching uh, uh, a rheumatologist needs to think about menopause as well. So it's far broader and bigger than only GPs and gynecologists. You're absolutely right. And so for now, it's, I always tell women who will listen to this podcast or read anything I share or post is to always be skeptical, even with me, you never know you, you, you can see so much stuff online, and there's information, yeah. misinformation, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And as yeah. well, that science continues to evolve. What we're saying today, maybe yeah. in five, 10 years, we're like, oops, <laughs> I don't know, hopefully not. Yeah. But, but I, I do want women to to also empower themselves and to be yeah. a little skeptical, to to ask the right questions, to see if this applies yeah. to them. Because yeah. you know, when they say, oh yeah, joint pain and all this stuff, yeah, menopause related or depression. Well, no, maybe you really do have, you know, some mechanical injury or depression that the hormones may help, but you know, you need to to also invest, be open to a, a lot of other things too. So I think it's we're still in this the, the education part is always. Mm, yeah, I, 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 it's a fine line sometimes. Yeah, and I I, I can't agree with you more because uh, there was recently published also a Lancet study, a Lancet paper, I need to say, which says that women need to be empowered by uh, embracing their uh, menopausal complaints. And of course, cognitive behavioral therapy can be very helpful. But my personal opinion is that women... Uh, uh, for instance, I see myself as a doctor who is counseling women, uh, is telling them all about the different options. And I think a woman needs to decide for herself in which way she needs or can be empowered. And that's different for every woman. It's not for our doctors to decide how women need to be empowered. Every woman decides that for herself, I think. And uh, so uh, I think we we need uh, and it's it's difficult with the right information like you said the disinformation that's a big problem and we are um, uh, well we're doing uh, some of us and I me too is I'm doing something we're starting with things on TikTok uh, that's it's called the doc on TikTok uh, doctors today and we're doing uh, we're starting uh, next month a specific uh, TikTok uh, channel uh, just for women but for all women also the younger women uh, like the right information about contraceptives but also about hormones also about premenstrual uh, syndrome and the more severe form PMDD which is still we don't have a guideline about PMDD for instance in the Netherlands or worldwide that's these are a very important topic so I think we need to take care as healthcare professionals to send the right information and women have, can decide for themselves which options are for her in person the best ones. 
you'll have to share the TikTok account <laughs> with me because that's yeah. a great way yeah. to send out yeah. information. I mean, that's yeah. where yeah. people's eyeballs are. But the problem is, yeah, anyone yeah. can have a TikTok channel. And that's why we need to yeah. be uh, mindful of who we follow and what we do yeah. and, and how we make our decisions. So well yeah. done on doing that. I'm excited to to see that because it's- <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah trip feeding us information because it, it yeah. is. And, and I think younger women need to pay attention. And when I bring yeah. up the topic of menopause to women in her twenties and thirties, she's just like, what? <laughs> I'm like, well, as far as I learned at 35, more or less, you know, mid thirties yeah. is when your progesterone starts going down. And no yeah. one told me that. And no. I wish I knew because I remember in my thirties, I was crying for no reason. I was like, well, I guess I have a lot on my plate. I don't know. Yeah. But now in retrospect, I thought, oh my gosh, because it kind of came and it went. And yeah. um, I was like, that must have been progesterone. <laughs> yeah. But it's important that we get this information. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah. What, what, I know we have only about 10 minutes to, to go and I have to let you go, but I would like to know what are some of the myths of menopause that you would like to disrupt or make women more aware of? Um, well, I think uh, the biggest myth we already discussed that HRT is uh, causing breast cancer and um, it depends on the, well, the types of HRT we worldwide use nowadays are really safe, specifically if you're uh, below 50 years of age, there are no risks and above 50 years of age, you have the, uh, the, the, the risk of breast cancer due to age of course uh, but usually women can uh, have they they can use in the long run lower levels of HRT uh, there is a myth in the Netherlands uh, which says that uh, if you stop HRT you still have to go through menopause and have all the costs they have the complaints all over again yeah exactly that's one of the myths that's not true it was uh, uh, because in, in about 10 years ago GPs were prescribing HRTs but only for six months and then women needed to stop and of course they got still had their complaints because menopausal can, complaints can last on the average four till seven or even more years so if you stop HRT after six months you're still into menopause and uh, it was said oh you see it doesn't help you still have to go through menopause so that's a myth and um, uh, yeah, that's, I think these are the biggest myths. There is also a myth, there are also myths that if you take the birth control pill or the hormone um, uh, dev interuterine device that you won't experience any menopausal complaints at all, that's a myth. Uh, and uh, there are some myths about sex as well, that uh, because we we see that the hormone which makes you susceptible for the sexual arousal is uh, testosterone, and testosterone doesn't change that much during menopausal transition. So some women have sexual problems, but that's usually uh, related to other factors. It's a biopsychological model, is that? And uh, we even see, uh, fortunately, that some women even have better sex during or after menopause. So there's a lot to do about sex. And um, yeah, these are some of the ones I can think of at this moment. Those are great. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm assuming you're training your doctors on these as well, uh, because yeah. we've all kind of grown up with these, thinking of these, these myths. So yeah. Yeah, no, this is wonderful. So I, I interesting about you brought up the testosterone because very often doctors, it's very similar in the US what you've you've mentioned so far yep. and in North America in general, but the doctors, especially I don't know, Spain, in my experience, I don't know, especially, but in Spain, in Portugal, what I've seen is they don't, they're not into testosterone. They're just say women don't need testosterone. Um, and it's not as prescribed here, or maybe they're just not up to speed. What are you seeing in Holland and other countries in Europe? And and what are your, is your opinion on testosterone too? 
Yeah, well, uh, the the one expert, in my opinion, about testosterone is Susan Davis. She's from Australia. As far as I know, uh, I heard lately there was one other country, but uh, as far as I know, Australia is the only country in the world who has testosterone, uh, testosterone product who is registered for women uh, worldwide. We have testosterone, of course, but not uh, registered for women. Uh, and I think there is the, she also wrote uh, together with some other authors, but also sexologists, there was a, a big groups with that, the global testosterone position paper. And uh, we, we follow that in the Netherlands. So uh, we know she was also in Firenze two weeks ago, and she has done a lot of research about that. We, uh, uh, she proved that testosterone has nothing to do with tiredness or lack of energy. And it's only helpful for women who have sexual uh, disorders or function, the dysfunction in, for instance, arousal. And uh, uh, that's what we do in the Netherlands as well. I, I prescribe testosterone sometimes, but only if strictly indicated and it might be helpful. But you usually see that there are other factors who are disturbing uh, the sex life of specific women. But so it's not only necessary, but if it's necessary, we I prescribe it. We do in the Netherlands, but it's not for the GPs. GPs don't prescribe it, only gynecologists. And when and you sexologist. Yeah. Oh, and sexologists. Yeah. But yeah, it's so but only than... uh, doctor, yeah. sexual sexologist doctors, not uh, uh, or MD. Yeah, yes, yes, of course, of course. Um, yeah, but it's interesting because it, it's still kind of testosterone still gets stuck in the corner of libido when yeah. in fact it has influence on motivation and the way you feel and and the muscle building and the it's just bones, everything is it's testosterone is to me, as I understand, is is not much more than just let's get some libido. No, there there is no influence of testosterone on the bone and also not on the other things you mentioned. That's what Susan Davis did research about. The most the main uh, reason to prescribe it is is for libido. That's uh, and uh, think that's uh, of course like HRT there is always a placebo effect mm -hmm. that's uh, but and and it's not we also know that if your level your blood level of testosterone which must be measured in specific laboratories uh, if your level of testosterone is normal and you add testosterone, it can even have some severe side effects which don't uh, uh, go away if you stop the testosterone. And like, for instance, too high testosterone levels have the same, uh, give the same complaints as too low testosterone effects. So for this, you really need some knowledge. And I think the global position paper uh, refers to that yeah mm, i'll have to get that and i just did an interview before you it's online it's on... online yeah yeah, yeah. and otherwise it, yeah. you should invite susan davis for a podcast yes she I've was one her. of the former ims presidents as well she's a great person and she has so much knowledge about testosterone she that would be little... great could you yeah. connect us because i would love to interview uh, her. lena can connect you probably from Thank emails you, because they uh yeah that would be great because I just did a podcast interview with Dr. Doug Lucas all about testosterone. Yeah. And so I was amazed, like, wow, it is not just about libido, but I would love to present him this paper and say, hey, just yeah. what are your thoughts yeah. on on yeah. what what this has said? So it'd be interesting to hear a little bit of a debate with that. I would, and and of course, get Susan Davis on here. I've heard her several yeah. times on other podcasts and it's, yeah. it's a, she's a great, a great person to, to interview. Mm -hmm. And, she, and yeah. I didn't realize she Definitely. did a whole- thing on testosterone so. yeah she knows the most about testosterone and she is there we're on this global position paper there were also several other societies not gynecology societies endocrinologic societies sexual there were a lot of big group of people who wrote it together mm, interesting 
Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to have to let you go, but I would yeah. love to, for you to share anything that you have in your world, other than you got the TikTok going, coming, coming up <laughs> soon, but are there any events or programs or books in the pipeline or anything that you're yeah. working on that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, uh, I wrote, uh, I, th I think, uh, and that's one of my missions. I think uh, the thing is, I don't know how it's elsewhere in the world, but for instance, we know that in the Netherlands, about 13 times more women die of cardiovascular disease than of breast cancer. And that still is not a topic because for our uh, health in the long run, uh, cardiovascular diseases and the knowledge about cardiovascular diseases and the risk factors for women, for instance, like during pregnancies, uh, diabetes, preeclampsia, hypertension, but also migraine is a risk factor or more than three miscarriages uh that's um uh so we we i think that's a very important topic in the netherlands when we turn 50 years of age we get our mammogram our breast cancer checkup we get uh, our pap smears and we get a, 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 a test for bowel cancer but nobody is checking us for the thing we die of so that i think that that we can make a big improvement in that as well and i think we um i always say to women if you have the feeling always listen to what you feel if you have the feeling something is not right uh, seek help or talk about it because you are always right if you have the feeling something is changing something is not right you might not even think about hormonal changes but uh, stay with yourself and seek help or talk about it that's uh, and I'm, I'm I wrote already a book about heart and hormones together with a cardiologist uh, Janneke Wittekoek uh, she's all, almost turned into my sister <laughs> and we're going to uh, I'm going to do the TikTok channel. I do it together with her about cardiovascular health, so hormonal and cardiovascular health, because it's very much connected. And we're also busy writing a second book about heart and hormones, but with more more information. The first one was very basic, and now we're doing it a little bit. Uh, uh, we're going to make it a little bit more complicating and and deeper into the um research as well wonderful advice for a woman going through the menopause transition and i'm i would love to get links to those books when they come out well the one that you already have and the one yeah. that's coming out i'll put that yeah. in the show notes it's Lena's in dutch that's oh, it's in dutch. it's in dutch yeah oh, we'll i'm have sorry to trade. yeah Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll have to, yeah, see if we can get a translation translator to do that because that's <laughs> that's probably really valuable information. Heart health. I'm yeah. I'm totally on board with this with with yeah. you as well. This is something we don't pay enough attention to, and yeah. so Lena here says the um we can always go to the yeah the Europe EMAS the European Menopause yeah. Association channel. There's social yeah. media channels as well, and. Yeah. Um, and there's actually, yeah, there's true. There's, there are free educational resources there as well. Yeah, exactly. And we start also, we have some EMAS webinars as well. And we also do EMAS summer school beginning of September. Uh, I'm one of the speakers as well, together with Petra Stuta, Irene Lambrinudaki and Elena Armeni. And we're talking, we're also talking for in doctors of internal medicines, endocrinologists. And uh, I think the EMAS website uh, covers a lot and you can have links also to other menopause societies. And there are also some women groups connected with EMAS as well. And for the grant, we use the women groups as well because we need the voice of the women. We can't make the change ourselves alone as healthcare professionals, we need the women. We have to do it together. I have to join that group now because I, yeah. I knew about, I get my my resources from the EMAS channel, yeah. but I have this as well. I have a whole page on my website about free resources and where, yeah. where you can get you know menopause information. In, yeah. Of course, EMS is included in there, but I would yeah. love to have a link. I'll have that in the show notes, but have a link yeah. to the, the social group as well because the, the social support is, is very, very important. Yeah, yeah. 
Wonderful. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to having you on again with results of this study <laughs> and, um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for having me and good luck to all the women worldwide. And I hope this helps a little bit and I wish you a good day as well.